Oh, hi everybody. Good evening. Uh, I am Ashish. I'm the founder and CEO of MASH Project Foundation, and I welcome you all to the fourth day of the inaugural Break the Wall. Break the Wall is an initiative by MASH Project Foundation in partnership with Pursuit of Balance, led by Nina Claire, which aims to build a platform to bring some very diverse and key voices in the sexuality, sexual and reproductive health ecosystem to come share about their experiences, share about our insights, and how we can make this platform to connect with many, many more young people and create us very strong partnerships which produce high impact results. In the last three days, we've had some amazing bunch of speakers who've come from different walks of the SRHR space and have shared some of the key insights with us. Today, we have two very interesting discussions happening. First, the panel discussion on how innovations in this new age organizations reinvent the marketplaces to be more inclusive and meet the demands of young India. Next, we're going to talk about pleasure and politics, which will be uh, moderated by my friend, Nina Claire. So without uh, spending too much time, I think I would right now quickly jump into our first panel discussion. And we have amazing set of panelists and the initiative Break the Wall is supported by our wonderful partners, including Birds in the Bee Stock program, uh, Condom Alliance, which is powered by Durex, institution partner, Shivnadar University, digital media partner, Josh, and media partners, Quintfit, Daily Hunt, and the knowledge partner, Purpose. So let's welcome our wonderful panelist. First, I have Karishma Swaru, who is a sexuality educator and founder of Talk You Never Got. Hi, Karishma. Could you hear me? Can you hear me, Krishna? There, can't hear you. Hello. Hi. Good evening. I think hey. it's. I don't know if it's my internet or yours. I can't hear half the words. I'm gonna oh, really? see what's going on. Oh, okay. No problem. I think we can okay, hear you. Okay, now I can. That's more important. Okay, great. Great. How are you doing? Thank good. you so much for having me. Same here. So just talking a little bit about Karishma. She's an internationally experienced sexuality educator who advocates uh, about the rights of young people, sexu uh, their sexual and reproductive health right, an undergrad from the Brown University and runs a very popular Instagram handle called Talk You Never Got. So thank you so much, Karishma, for joining us. Next, we have uh, Kavita Ayagari, who is the country director and India lead for Howard Delafield International. Hi, Kavita. Hi, hi, Ashish. Really nice to be here. Thank you so much. Great. And talking a little bit about yourself, I think you bring some almost two decades of ex rich experience working in the public health advocacy, marketing, communications, and partnerships when it comes to the development sector. And I think uh, we will hear from, uh, from you about this very interesting and innovative game that is being developed by an organization called Game of Choice and Not Chance. And uh, uh, I think personally, I've had a chance to learn about it uh, in the last few weeks. So would be very happy to share it with our audience today. So thanks Thank for you. joining. Yes. Yeah, so next we have Nu, who's the founder of Revival Disability Community. Hello, Nu. Uh, hi. Can, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I could hear you very well. Okay. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you so much for inviting me and for this opportunity. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you so much, New, and it's our pleasure and honor to have you. I think uh, uh, you you bring so much value uh, to our discussion today. Um, so talking about New a little bit, she ident uh, New, uh, the, identifies as a non-binary disabled queer person and is a psychology graduate from the Lady Sri Ram College for Women, Delhi University. Uh, they're a disability justice author, community organization, <laughs> community organizer, and also <laughs> calls herself occasionally a bad bitch. Uh, they are a founder of Revival Disability Collective, a community for and by the disabled folks uh, in India, and firmly believes in the intersectionality which gives disabled people the emotional skin to survive in the world that is vulner where vulnerability should be celebrated. And um, I think she also brings a lot of uh, value in terms of bringing a young person's uh, why voice to this discussion today. So thank you so much, New, for joining us. Uh, last but not the least, uh, uh, please join me in welcoming Sachi Malhotra, who's the founder of That Sassy Thing. Hey, Sassy. 
Hi, <laughs> thanks for calling me Sassy. That's nice. Right. <laughs> um, well, it's good. Uh, hi, to thank you for calling me Sassy. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, Sassy. No, I appreciate uh, it. Like it's synonymous. Um, yeah. Yeah, we will talk about how did you came about that name. Uh, but uh, just quickly introducing. So, you are uh, Sachi is the founder of that Sassy thing, which designs natural plant based products for people's bodies. and uh, she's worked across sexual wellness brands in india and the us and has realized that the segments was always mostly dominated by uh, particularly men focused products um, and also having conversation which are aim- aimed towards men so i think uh, it's a fresh change and i've uh, personally been seeing uh, the journey uh, sachi in the last few months and uh, congratulations for building such a fantastic uh, brand uh, and uh, kudos to you Thank you so much, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Awesome! So very, very excited. It's a, uh, I think, a panel filled with a lot of interesting, uh, uh, you know, people with done done some very innovative things. So I'll quickly jump into our uh, discussion, and I'd like to open up with asking our amazing bunch of speakers about a little bit about their inspirations on why they started what they're doing. I think it's very important uh, for our young audience to know that how do you you know draw inspiration in terms of whatever you're doing so i would like to start with karishma tell us about you know briefly about your journey about how did the idea came through what inspired you and little bit more about what you're doing right now yeah absolutely so my journey with sex ed started when i was in college and um i just joined college i was like in my freshman year um and i was in a play and the director of the play was someone who was in second year college and he was like oh yeah you know on uh, once a week i go and teach sex ed to high school students and i remember thinking what like someone my age goes and teaches sex ed to other people i was shocked i i just like then other people around me started to make jokes and all and i was just like wow they're saying things what is this oil based water based lubricant like i've never heard of any of this right like even so at my own age i don't have any of this knowledge and i think then over the course of that year my mind was just getting stretched in all directions by being in college and like being around some of these ideas and being in like a sex positive culture for context like i went to college um at brown in the us and um then i joined the student group through which my friend was doing this work and worked very closely with plant parenthood for 3 years and that's when i really started to realize that like sex ed is something that covers like 10 different topics at once it is not just about health education or consent education it is also just values based education it you know it's it's about respecting other people respecting people's identities and histories and backgrounds and i think that was just really inspiring to me in ways that um i i would have not known that what sex ed even was if i hadn't done that um and then when when i was coming home for breaks while i was still in college i started to work with a school in my city here in calcutta and um realized that the same questions were coming up regardless of geography and everyone has the same misconceptions about their bodies everyone's watching the same movies and tv shows and you know coming across the same pornography around the world and that's when i was like okay I need to do this work here. I need to do this work um, with my home community as well. And uh, really, it was at the start of the pandemic when I was like, okay, I need to reach young people. I don't know how to reach young people. I really thought the answer was to do it through schools because that's how I'd always done it. But with the start of the pandemic, schools were scrambling. There was just a lot going on for schools trying to shift online, trying to manage the lives of their students, teachers. You know, we didn't even know what the pandemic Karishma, I think uh, we can't hear you. Can you hear me? No, right? I think you froze. Okay. We'll wait to get back to Karishma, but I'll go with the same question in the meantime we have Karishma back. to sachi sachi what's been your journey and inspiration um i think my inspiration comes from a very very deeply personal space uh, i was bullied and i was uh, shamed in high school for being big and having excessive body hair you know all across my body um and i just realized that you know this happens to a lot of uh, you know women um, growing up 
and uh, I always wanted to talk about those things. So I have polycystic ovarian syndrome for PCOS for around uh, 15 plus years now. And a lot of the symptoms included, you know, being big, having excessive body hair, but it was such a hush hush affair. Um, and, you know, even when I went to gynecologists, it was a lot about treating, you know, the problem, so-called problem on the outside and not really talking about what was happening internally, how I felt about my body, uh, the body image issues that I had, how that affected my self-confidence, um, you know, how I had mental health issues as well. There was no conversation around that. 15 years back so I think I always wanted to talk um, or you know rather have a space where we could talk about our bodies in a in a very judgment free and you know shame free uh, manner um, and rather be shameless about it actually that's what the brand is all about um, yeah so I, I think when I was younger I just didn't know how when or where to do it um, fast forward to a few years I think I'm trying to figure it out now with that sassy thing being that platform um, and also, you know, in my professional career, I actually worked with some sexual wellness brands in India and the US as well. And I realized that um, the whole category in terms of A, the product, the narrative, the cultural conversations that were happening were very cis men focused. Um, and people of other genders were not even a part of, you know, uh, <laughs> this whole category in that sense. And even portrayal in pop culture was super hyper masculine. Um, and even when you look at the definition of sex, it, it was just portrayed in a very, in a very narrow, from a very narrow lens, um, you know, and not inclusive in terms of different bodies, different people, different genders, even different relationships. And I, I think that Sassy thing is here to change that. So we are a new age sexual wellness brand and we design products that are free of any harmful chemicals, all plant-based products that are good for people's bodies. Um, and also, like, our goal is to educate people about their bodies and also the ingredients that should go down there and the ingredients that shouldn't because we are not taught anything about our bodies growing up, let alone the ingredients that should go there uh, and, you know, that are not, um, you know, uh, good for us also. So we want to change that and we want to be transparent about and are transparent about all ingredients that go in our products. Um, yeah, and I think... Over a period of time, I'm running the brand up and realized that it's not just, um, you know, the uh, like we have a challenge where we are not just fighting, you know, the notions that have been set by age old brands in this category, but also a lot of internalized misogyny that a lot of women are, are raised with. So I think our goal is to really talk about all those things and uh, really sass that, sass the patriarchy one conversation at a time. Wonderful. Awesome. We'll come back to Karishma so she can complete. Uh, so Karishma, we have you back, right? I'm so sorry. Just when I'm singing oh. praises of the internet, it decides to fail me. Um, <laughs> but uh, yes, so I basically wanted to reach young people and I realized like, Today's, in today's day and age, also just the way I consume and learn so much information is on the internet. And that's why I, I decided to just try out Instagram as a platform because that's a place where I think people um, have shifted towards following people who they want to learn from and um, following content where they want to learn. And it's it's moved away from being what it once was, where it was just about beauty and fashion and travel. You know, I think I think the shift, the cultural shift is happening where we use social media also for gathering information in a way that's like fun, digestible um, and not like super scary or serious. Right. And I think um, what, what that also gave me what I didn't know when I started out, but what that gave me was this freedom to express myself without having to filter myself based on what a school principal wants me to say. I, I still have to filter myself based on what Instagram wants me to say and not say. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> and I'm sure others here uh, will will uh, relate to that. But uh, yeah, that's that's a little bit about why I started what I started doing because I just I think like talking about sex and talking about sexuality education was one of the most empowering things I'd ever done. And I was like, just knowing, literally just knowing what my, how my body works 
is so empowering and i can't believe like that that information is like a safely guarded secret by the patriarchy and so um we're all here to dismantle that i know i'm not alone in my effort but just really grateful to uh, have have a community that i can lean on such as yeah. the folks and the great thing is like the platforms like instagram and so many other digital platforms is allowing us to do more and more as we go you know along right so that's amazing like i mean i think the work that you've done congratulations so i'll come to new now right let's uh, hear new from you uh, what has been your story what has been your inspiration behind revival disability community yeah okay so um for me i think a lot of um what sachi said i really related to that because even i was bullied in school but not in the um overt way um i was bullied in a very um i was alienated you know alienated from conversations around um everything one minute i'm so sorry uh my cam keeps switching off yeah no way so um you know alienated from conversations around sexuality around identity around um um around being attracted to the opposite sex um and i always saw myself as um heterosexual it was like a compulsive need to be you know a military normative to um to kind of um achieve uh, a military normativeness to uh, achieve able bodiness because we we all grew up in a world full of like able body structures of everything of love of independence of freedom um of productivity right so i feel like uh, for the for my entire life i have hated my disabled body um i used to wear these braces um in school Uh, which kind of prevented me from um you know being my authentic self in a way like dressing in a uh, in my authentic style um you know wearing short skirts like a nine nine grader would want to and um i i i would call them these giant monstrous shoes right and um i always wanted to like catch up with my even bodied classmates in a way right catch up with um okay so they are dating now so i have to date now um they are um losing their oh i think uh, there is yeah. some technical uh, okay. oh we have yeah. back Hi, yeah. can you hear us yeah yeah so uh, they they are losing their virginity in that sense like uh, how we used to think in school that we need to lose our virginity because we need to achieve a kind of um non virginity and we need to catch up with our peers right so i've always felt that way and i think um with revival um at the age of 22 um i finally realized um my identity and uh, my mom told me something that i can't empower others unless i empower myself and as we know structural empowerment themselves is a uh, is a privilege right to rebel is a privilege and to have access to support structures everything lies in access we have to be grateful we have to acknowledge access because that's what that's what the world runs on right um so um when i started revival it was more like for me uh, it was more like no survival right and after i started coming out with a disability except i never had to come out with a disability because i'm already pretty visibly disabled i just had to convince myself yes i'm disabled and that's okay right i have a disabled voice and that's okay i need to um get it out into the world right um so in a way 
And that's not in revival. And I always say that I'm not self-made. I'm always community made. I'm I'm here because of my community, because of the various conversations that we have in our community, building disabled futures and building our own affirmative disabled haven. Yeah. So why don't we hear a little bit more from Numu on what does revival do? I know that you shared a short yes. presentation. Just would yes. you like us to yes. run that? Um, yeah. Sure, uh, one, one thing. Um, yeah. One thing. Yeah. My screen is going to go off. So because that's what the webcam does in this laptop. I don't know. Uh, so it's no. okay, right? You can hear me. We can hear you fine. And we have the slides okay. up. If I request All my right. colleagues uh, play the slideshow. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm just playing it. Uh, it's is it visible? Just one. Yes, it is visible. Okay. So um, uh, yeah. So introducing to you revival disability community, an affirmative Desi community of disabled and queer folks in India. Uh, plus also a ma magazine focusing on narratives of disability queerness and intersectional desire. We aim to reclaim stories of disability in India through first person narratives. And we also call ourselves the Crip Revolution Cuties. So um, this is just a note from me. Um, each time I introduce Revival Disability Collective to the world, be it in webinars, Zoom conversations, or offline, it is always an act of dissent, a product of collective labor and love a performance of disabled joy, anger, vulnerability, and sadness. As disabled folks, we deserve every single thing. We deserve so much more. We deserve an accessible world, wonderful friends, great sex, however that looks for each individual, and collective joy. As I'm reintroducing my queer and disabled self to the world, um, after so many waves of COVID, I've observed how the pandemic has been designed only for one specific ability, how safety measures, access to dating, communication structures, access to expression, access to recreation, have all been designed for the non-disabled world, pushing and invisibilizing disabled folks further into the margins. Within this context, revival comes, comes into play as, a, as an online collective of disabled and queer folks in India, a very important way in which revival has helped me is that it's made me unashamed and unapologetic of my body, being proud of my disabled voice, and taking up well-deserved space. Um, so I'll just move to the next slide. Uh, so, you know, our mission statement is that um, I've noticed how um, uh, in, the, in the queer space, how I've never really um, felt like I ever belonged because there's always a certain queer aesthetic or certain queer evil movement that individuals have to abide to, right? Um, we need to make Instagram reels or we need to move in a certain way that is, um, that is attractive in a sense. So as a physically disabled queer individual, I'm never really, um, I'm never really related to that. So I've also wanted to make um, revival, you know, a queer space, which creates its own kind of disabled queerness, creating space for disabled intimacy, joy, agency, and comfort. When we talk about intimacy, which bodies are we really talking about? Um, like Sachi said, right? Which bodies are we talking about? In our biolo biology books, uh, are we asking the right questions or just being content by uttering the word intersectionality and just being perceived as inclusive and not really putting it into practice? Are we taking into account our intersectional histories, invisible identities, caste, abilities, sexualities? Why is movement the norm? Why is movement equated to freedom? I've literally formed revival from my bed, which is kind of ironic because I'm I'm sitting on the same bed I formed revival from, right? Like like Karishma said, um, Instagram has been made so accessible to 
so many different communities um online communities of care are so accessible to disabled folk but at the same time there's also privilege that comes with it uh, there's also and we have to have an internet connection right we need to have access to software apps in order to form a community um so for us disabled women disabled folks disabled non binary individuals most trade offs between pleasure and pain are not as sexy as bdsm in fact our trade offs include on the dark side of pleasure trips to the hospital awkward explanations to a doctor a sprained hand no wonder then that we never ever choose our pleasure or put it first our bodies often feel like they are built solely for pain um structures such as dating or even moving on structures such as, such as finding a rebound right are not built for a uh, disabled folk disabled women um revival disability is a space where disabled queer folk are free to be and express who whoever and whatever they want to uh, they want to meet we carving our own disabled haven and building an affirmative future um this is uh, unhide the horny which is um you know a campaign that we are running um uh, we asked members of the revival community how their able bodied partners reacted to their sexual needs and desires the following were their responses Most of my partners felt like they had to be very careful around me, which was very awkward. Because who the who the fuck wants to be treated with fragility when you're horny? Definitely not me. It was hard for them to let go and treat me like any other person. Caring for someone is sweet, but we need to draw a boundary between caring too much and being controlling. I am an infantilize often in a relationship. Honestly, I'm just like, who will? I just go home and fuck myself. Reclaiming my disabled nude body has been so damn empowering, more empowering than any other relationship. If I'm being honest, sometimes you just don't want to be reminded of your chronic illness. You want your attractiveness to overpower your partner and not be treated differently. How many disabled sex scenes have we seen on television? In a country like India, disabled sex ed is non-existent. I'm disabled, but I, but I'm I'm still a person with needs and desires. I deserve so much more. Just because I want to have sex with you doesn't mean I want to tell you about my disability. In fact, sometimes it's far from it. I can be intimate without wanting to list out my diagnosis and explain how my body works, because. Frankly, that's exhausting. Not your dainty darlings, because everybody walks around eggshells around us. Um, this is just introducing everyone to the community, which is aimed at uh, empowering fellow disabled folks to take up space. So once I realized my identity, I realized um I had to like I wanted to also make this a collective space for my disabled friends. Right. Uh, so as disabled, yeah. Look, how big is your community? If I may ask, how many people are there now? Um, there are three hundred plus um yeah. folks on like a WhatsApp community, and like on all platforms. Um, we have on we have a Facebook group and then WhatsApp group, and um, yeah, it, it's it's growing. Yeah, Wonderful. it's growing day by day. Oh. I and, hope uh, uh, there are many, many more people who will be joining, who are watching you today, who joins you. You know, thank you so much. Them. Great. Yeah, I'm very, very glad that uh, we could have you uh, talk and present. It's very, very inspiring work. Thank you. Super. Awesome. Uh, okay, so I'll just stop screen. Sure, sure. Yeah. Great. Let's hear from Kavita now. After such an inspiring time, let's hear from Kavita about the work at Howard Elephant. So um, thank you all, and uh, you all are so inspiring. Um, and uh, it's really great to hear your stories. I don't think um, I could have come on a forum and said all the things you did 
uh, you know, 20 years back when I started working at all. So, I mean, it's really so good to hear you all speak and the kind of issues you've taken are so, so close to you. Um, so I just want to talk a little about, um, you know, Game of Choice, Not Chance, and uh, the founder, Susan Howard. Uh, and I represent Howard Delafield International. So this is Susan's story, really. And um, and I would uh, the game is totally inspired by her own personal life. So, you know, I can see it as saying in each one of your, you know, when Sachi talked about it, when Karishma talked about how she got into it. And then Nu talks about her own experiences. So uh, this too, I mean, the game of choice, not chance, came about because um, Susan was really inspired by her mom, who in the 1950s really put her foot down decided to take a journey for further education to the US, um, had to make trade-offs in the process, had to agree to marry or get engaged actually before she left. Um, those days, and especially exactly what you said, it's it's a privilege to do these things. You know, girls are able to do these things today because they have the privilege. Uh, they have parents who support, they have loans which are available, so many things. And in those days and times when it was hard, it was hard to, you know, you had to first get through, you had to get a scholarship, uh, convincing parents of wanting to study further in an age where, you know, marriage was the accepted norm for girls um, of a young age and you, you've kind of done your, you know, you've done your graduation or you want to do, it's, it's unheard of to kind of want to do further studies unless you're like training to be a doctor or something like that, you know, in India. So that's the story that's really inspired the game. And it's really about making sure that girls understand that their decisions matter. Um, their voices matter, their choices matter. If girls want to realize their full potential, really um, live the dream or live what they aspire to be, what they aspire to go to, then they really need, like you said, uh, to first thing, decide that they're going to support their themselves, their dreams, their aspirations. And after that, everything, you know, starts to fall into place. So that's what the game is about. The young protagonist in the game is Nisha. And uh, her story is all about this learning as she plays to take decisions that are in her favor and experiencing the outcomes of those decisions in a much more safe world because the virtual world of games allows you to play again, uh, make mistakes. There are no hard consequences for making those mistakes. So that's where the game is really offering uh, young girls, uh, you know, aged around 15 to 19, to really take decisions in their favor, to explore their choices and to explore their full potential, to really rally support around themselves. And I think the biggest thing for us is that even today, for young girls, you know, um, other people make choices for them. Other people make decisions for them. It's not. It's not really. You know. It's. It's. If if you you don't agree with what the you know what your parents are saying or you you know what your classmates are doing, you want to do something completely different. It is really hard. It is not easy. And to be confident that your decisions are going to turn out in your favor is also not a given, right? You don't know how it's going to turn out. So there's a lot of uncertainty, and therefore there's insecurity linked with it. And therefore, there's pressure from parents not to go down the untrodden path, you know, to stick to what is known. So we feel that girls, like the same is not true, uh, you know, for, for let's say, uh, boys as much. Boys get to experiment a lot more in their decision making than girls do, for whom everything is almost like pre-decided, especially younger when it comes to younger girls. So that's really the focus of our game. It's really a safe space for girls to explore a lot of decision making and choices, uh, which help them, you know, realize what they want to do, where they want to go, what they want to be in life. Beautiful, very, very interesting. I think we have all of you have such amazing, inspiring stories. So, um, taking the conversation ahead, you know, since a lot of audience look up to people like you who also have, uh have similar kind of challenges or for that matter also began on a journey start something of their own or part of such uh really uh, amazing initiatives right which are creating uh some very positive impact uh in the in the space so uh but what is would be interesting to also understand about each one of your challenges in the for you know early stages of starting up right uh be it a, a venture which uh, such started to a 
you know, a, a Instagram uh, page like a Karishma, what you're doing, and then to know as a collective that you're building, right? So, with three of you would like to understand, uh, talk us, talk about what are the uh, some of those challenges that you faced, how you overcome overcame them, and what kind of support system also that you built around yourself. So, it's particularly for people who are looking out to start or have already, you know, in the very initial stage uh, stages of their journey. So I'll start that uh, first with Karishma. Sure, absolutely. So I think I'll start with I'll start with the one I kind of started to talk about, which was Instagram deciding what we get to say. And I think um, that is that is something that is becoming or has become more salient since the time that I started my page about a little over a year ago, um, where Instagram keeps updating its community guidelines and basically straight up like facebook rules uh, especially around advertising and things say that we're not allowed to talk about pleasure and it is really unfortunate because what in, what ends up happening is that all the misinformation websites they make it through these um censorship there is even like pornographic stuff that will make it through and when i say pornographic i'm not saying all porn is bad but just saying that like mainstream pornography has a lot of problems um in the way that it represents people's bodies and things like that and so it is a little bit of a struggle in terms of just we don't have full agency and freedom and we're always at the mercy of like will instagram take a post down will it take the full account down i've i've seen other sexuality educators in this in the instagram space who lost the entire account or lost the ability to post or go live for a week or whatever and uh, if if you are someone who's doing this work primarily through instagram it can be genuinely really challenging to do that um so i think that's one big challenge i think the second big challenge is that um when you work on a platform like Instagram, where it feels like it's just you. Um, it feels like it's you against the world almost. Not saying that that's the case in the general realm of sex ed, but I think when like you show your face and you talk about sex, um, people feel much more empowered to come forward with troll comments, with um, unsolicited dick pics, whatever it might be, right? Like I think some of those things that happen, um, the online like harassment and stuff is is something that it has taken me time to learn um, how to weed out, how to just like block people even and sometimes it it is people just coming from a place of genuinely like not knowing who else to go to on or, or like you know someone sent a dick pic being like can you tell me if i have an issue and i'm like no no i cannot like firstly i'm not a doctor but secondly like that's just not okay like and that that just underscores the importance of like why we have platforms like this right why, uh, or why we need to do the sex ed work um because people just don't know the boundaries of what's okay and what's not okay and i think that's one of the big big challenges of working um in this space that you know anyone can reach you and anyone can say whatever they want and some of that stuff will never get blocked whoever like a random stranger who have never messaged can send me a dick pic but you know educational content gets flagged by community guidelines so i think those are a couple of the big ones i think the third big one i'm going to say and i and i think we might talk about this like more broadly also but just like finding and this is not in the instagram realm but a little bit broader looking also at um just doing freelancing as a sex educator trying to access schools trying to access uh, communities more broadly speaking i think one of the big challenges is that because it's not a formalized space there is very little enthusiasm for people to pay because they don't know what they're missing out on and yeah. um, a lot of times people expect you to do it like for free for student and the part of it is the issue right like that it's if it's a student organization inviting a professional they don't have funds to pay or if it's um you know like so basically i think the ability to pay becomes an issue for many groups and organizations and things like that but also like for me that's why when you started introducing me some people might have noticed that i have a full-time job outside of all the sex head work that i do i work in consulting um during the day and that's just because 
my sex ed income is just not one that is at a place where I can like rely on it 100% of the time. Yeah. Okay. Those were my three big ones. I'm going to stop there. Otherwise, I'll keep going all day. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay. I'll come to Sachi now. Sachi, what about uh, has been some of these challenges when you started up or, you know? Um, yeah, I think some of them were mentioned by Karishma already. So I'm not going to repeat all the Instagram shadow banning and, you know, all that annoying stuff that Instagram, you know, uh, like pushes, uh, pushes at us. Um, but I think the biggest challenge has been a there is a lack of publicly available uh, data when it comes to you know um, sexuality and and sexual health uh, when it comes to Indian specifically. So just you know like linking to that another challenge has been having uh, open and on honest conversations with women, uh, understanding how they view sexuality and what their experiences have been in the bedroom and beyond. That's been really really challenging. You know when I got started. Um, uh, a year ago um i just i learned that no matter where people came from they would either either you know judge themselves or judge people around them um and i just realized that's something that really you know has to change um and running a sexual wellness brand in india is uh, i would say super challenging when it comes to being a woman running a sexual wellness brand it's just 10 times more challenging if not more um i remember in the initial days when I was working on, you know, cracking the right formulations for all our products, especially um, the sexual lubricant 2018, 2019 uh, was when I was working on that. I could not find the right manufacturer who a understood my vision, uh, you know, and why I wanted to make these products, why they also had to be vagina friendly. Um, and also the fact that I didn't want to add that 0.001% of propylene glycol which is a petroleum derived ingredient and it's not good for people with vagina so there was a lot of sexism that I faced in the manufacturing space to begin with so just finding a right partner was just so difficult it took me like a really long time to kind of get get there you know um and then of course there are the cultural taboos I remember when I broke it to my parents especially my mom and I went like I want to make loops for a living um I was very dramatic about it I must say <laughs> She was just flabbergasted. She was just like, oh my God, beta, what will they say? You know, the classic, uh, what are people going to say? What will they think? Uh, you know, I was like, I don't care about that. And it's, it's high time you stop caring too. Um, I want you know, I to know, know how she takes it now. How, what, what does she tell us to, <laughs> you know, her friends? What does my daughter do? Uh, now, I mean, everyone knows it. They all read about it. So uh, they're all like, okay, way to go with thumbs up emojis and things like that. <laughs> Just keeping it very generic, <laughs> I would say, not acknowledging it, you know, um, all the time. But yeah, like, I think I think it's way more uh, normalized now, but it's taken a lot of time and a lot of conversation involving, I would say, people, uh, family, friends in the whole process as well. Uh, I think that's really, really important uh, when it comes to running a brand in this space as well. But yeah, I remember, I think one of the instances was when it was one of my cousin's wedding and I wanted to gift her my products, but my, my mom just flipped again and she was like, but what if the in-laws see the product? And I'm just like, it's okay. <laughs> so the list is never ending. But I think operationally, um, um, the challenges um, are also, I think, when it comes to running the business, I think it's about... Um, I think Karish already mentioned the Instagram bit. We are an Instagram first brand, so it becomes really challenging when Instagram is shadow banning our content, uh, yeah. ads not getting approved, things like that. But also payment gateways taking like 10 times longer to integrate with our website versus a regular business, you know, yeah. uh, any other business in the world. Oh, I remember yeah. this really crazy, really crazy instance where... Um, we were actually applying for an approval, uh, you know, for one of our products. Uh, you know, one of the licensing authorities had to give us an approval for a recent product that we launched a couple of months back. It's a plant-based underwear detergent. Um, so that got rejected because it had the word underwear in it. Um, and it was considered, because the word underwear was considered vulgar. And sadly, this oh, was yeah. by a woman who rejected it. Can you oh, even yeah. imagine? So I have all these struggles before I can even get my product out in the market. So I have to like cross all these hurdles before that. And then face all that <laughs> craziness, craziness that follows, you know, once the, the product is out there. Uh, yeah, we, we had to change the. Sachi, 
I know there are a lot of yeah. these challenges, and I think all industries, but specifically yeah. when you're do- working in a uh, sexuality space, for that matter, will be far more. But tell us, who are the champions? Who are the initial supporters? How is the ecosystem also changing? What are the those you know uh, people who will like support you? You know, love to understand yeah. a little bit more about that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think friends, family, um, you know, mentors. I have a. Uh, i have a tribe i think that has been really supportive uh, and i think a lot of the educators in the community including karishma as well uh, and i would say nu also because we are actually currently working on a project with nu as well um, which is going to be out soon uh, so i think community is really really important i can't harp more on that and you know people who want to enter the space as well i think it's so important to have allies uh, and also people who understand the challenges that you're going through because they are so unique that uh, an average person might not really might not really get it in a way um so at times i think you just need people to just say that it's okay and you know you'll get through it uh, it's okay you've gone through so much and you know this will this will uh, yeah. this too shall pass um yeah and i think i think that's been really amazing of course needless to say our customers as well we have a really um supportive community there too and they've been really understanding and um, you know very loving and uh, super supportive too so i think it's it's everyone kind of coming together that's definitely been the bright side uh, and why sure. we keep doing what we do absolutely and i think the community like you highlighted is a very important factor for you to you know as a as a young person or as a as an entrepreneur always uh, uh, you know to look back upon as a support system right uh but since we are also running out of uh, time we may not have so i would like to bring this question at this point only uh such as since you've been an entrepreneur and you've uh, now now built a business around, around this right uh if you could also tell our audience who are looking to start up in this space you know how's ecosystem like sh- shaping up are there like uh, so many incubators which are supporting sustainability focused startups healthcare startups edtech all that stuff right so do you see that kind of shaping happening are there investors who are very keen on jumping because they see this sector is growing and it's getting kind of hot right uh, if you can share some more light since you're being you're so closely involved with the uh, ecosystem there yeah uh, i think when it comes to investors i've not had the best experiences with fundraising personally because i think um, sexual wellness in the direct to consumer space is very new in india right now um the space is very evolved you know globally so i think the scenario has changed there but it's taken a lot of time um and i think a lot of people entrepreneurs and and uh, investors are still figuring a lot out um and i think to add to that i think um a lot of investors are also still playing too safe uh so their loss <laughs> i guess um yeah. but but i think um my advice to a lot of people a lot of women who are in this space would be to build your business out with your own resources if you can of course you know i'm i mean it's not the same for for everyone but if they can i think uh try doing that and i think not focus on a very investor led business in the domain i think be in it for the long run have a a mission and you know have a vision in mind and also a north star like you know your guiding light is why you're doing what you're doing because that's something that gets you through in the tough times um so i think it's it's really important to not just rely on investors because it is a new space and uh, honestly i think the investment space is also very very um i would say dominated by men again and there are not a lot of women investors if you look at statistics also which can be you know uh, discouraging as well so i'd say you know be in it for the long run um do your thing and you know be honest to and be true to yourself that's really important and i think if um there is someone who believes in what you're doing believes in your vision um i think they'll join you in the journey real soon i hope i find that too <laughs> so yeah superb and we wish you all the bu- luck let's come to kavita and like understand from her like she's working on this very interesting game game of choice and not chance and gamification is also very very growing a uh, space in terms of educating and making awareness and also you know creating a behavioral shift over a long term so kavita uh, tell us a little more about uh, this in a project um so you know um, if you'll allow me ashish i'd like to show a little because what's a game if you can't show what you're going to you know what you're making so i'm going to share i'm going to stop my camera and share my presentation um sure. 
yeah yeah thank you uh, michael lee can help put the presentation and video up yeah so no i, I think um we decided ashish that i'll i'll share it so. oh okay sure i hope you can see my screen yes we can okay fabulous so very quickly i just want to you asked me a question about how we think okay. um, you, yeah if you could play this then you can have the full full screen view right now we just see our uh, presentation view that's that's odd because i've put it in play mode okay, yeah just play it again once yeah i've done it can you see it in uh, full screen uh no i think we still see it in a uh, pure uh, presentation mode only but that's okay i think it's visible though uh um, for some reason we can't see you yeah. yeah. okay let's try again no worries otherwise it's fine we can uh go ahead with this also we made it full screen now we can speak yeah okay so um here uh, basically uh, you know game of choice not chance it's 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 a game so it's not just a game though it's it's uh, a digital platform for mobile games so there's more than one game that we are making the first game that we are making is for girls but there is a game for boys that's in the anvil so it's really uh, using the power of game play to support young people uh, to become informed and active decision makers in their own lives so that's what we say i mean how can you equip young people both girls and boys to really realize their full potential to make decisions that matter to them so that's really the premise between you know behind game of choice not chance um most of it is really based on uh, the formative research we did uh, when we started working in this area so we learned that there just so many girls that lack decision making agency uh, when it comes to their own sexual wellness their own reproductive health they lack confidence to negotiate relationships this is all from the research um as young as 15 to 19 and each one of them talked about how fewer reproductive health resources were available to them they was very low priority given to their education their choices of career um and it was almost as if Uh, for girls in a slightly lower economic setup um uh, marriage was the option which is that the reason they they are getting educated is to get married or if they drop out of education it is to get married and again now uh, early uh, adolescent pregnancy is a challenge and um, our country is really has faced that challenge for a long time so it's it's really heartening that the government is considering increasing the age of marriage but that doesn't stop girls from getting married off at a younger age that still continues in society so this game is really a new role play based game its uh, central protagonist is nisha and it's based uh, on uh, you know uh, our research in rajasthan bihar and delhi and this game is all about uh, you know nisha's world so in this game girls get to experience um and make decisions for the central character which is nisha and uh, you know then experience the choices that she makes and Amita, also the proper choices sorry yeah. are you are you changing your uh, slides or because we just see the first slide yeah i am oh, i'm so sorry i think we just sorry. oh yeah now we can see is it now you can see the slide yeah we can see the slide four yeah Okay, I'm so sorry. I didn't even realize that this wasn't playing. Um, no okay, so I'm just going to go ahead like this. I hope it just uh, goes to the next slide. Um, and uh, the aim of the game is really to improve girls' knowledge about menstruation, about consent, about FP, which is family planning and, and uh, reproductive health. It is to improve girls' attitudes and confidence. and give them you know a decision making support for the choices that they make it's to expand access so it's really the game is a platform for uh, connecting them to resources and also we want to contribute to game based learning which is that what did girls learn what did girls you know um did their attitudes change did they act the way we thought they would or did they make choices that were more confident did they did they choose to do what they wanted to do versus what was safe to do so i'm going to show this and i hope this plays um, 
Is it playing? Yes. Mai kya karu? Um, Nisha, क्या मैं तुम्हें किस कर सकता हूँ? अब क्या? ठीक है. So, you know, just like that, it's, um, it's a game which, um, uh, which, uh, which, um, which actually helps girls make choices. It, um, it makes uh, girls, you, if you saw the way it moved, I mean, Ayush, which is her new, uh, you know, she's just met him. She's very interested in him. He asks her if she can kiss and she has an option to say yes, no. And right. uh, we really introduce this entire concept of consent uh, through this so this entire episode plays out where we where we actually talk to girls about consent and what it is and uh, you know what it entails and that she has the power to say no apart from that we also are providing girls direct access so there is direct access to products there is direct access to a chatbot that they can interact with and there is direct access to video playlists which are within the game and um, these videos are really about all the subjects that concern them, be it menstruation, be it uh, you know contraception, be it um, fertility awareness, be it consent, be it career choices. And right. uh, it's a game, so it's um, it's all about character customization. It's it allows you to explore products, so it introduces products, and you can browse through what they are all about. There are mini games inside it, and there is a microsite at the back of it. Very, very so interesting. When are you planning? When are you planning to launch this, Kavita? So we are planning to launch it in May of okay. 2022. So we are majorly excited about launching this game, and it's uh, it's going to be available on Google Play Store. Oh wow! Free awesome. Free to download and play. Really looking forward to that. Thanks a lot. I think it's a very, very interesting idea and how the messaging can be made through like level and gamification. So very excited for this. I'm getting a message from my team that we're literally running, running out of time. So I would request all our wonderful panelists if they can quickly sum up in terms of like any closing remarks for our young audiences who are a lot of them looking to make change out there to do some disruptive things in how to build inclusive spaces, right? And at the same time, like if you have any important message that you would want to give so who would like to go first since we've literally run out of time it was so interesting that i i lost track of the time but uh should we start uh karishma first with you you seem like you're sure. ready <laughs> absolutely yeah. i'm gonna answer um specifically about building inclusive spaces i think um if you are someone who wants to create change you want to create a culture shift make sure whatever change you create includes the people who are most marginalized in every way possible, right? So we're talking about most marginalized in terms of, you know, most queer, fat, disabled. Um, we're talking about um, across levels of income, caste, uh, class, race, whatever you might think of, if if we aren't including people in the conversation who are um, most marginalized, we are not being truly inclusive. And I think this is something that I'm also working on through my work. Uh, definitely, it is an ongoing journey, especially if you're someone who's born with privilege. Um, I think unlearning some of the unconscious internal biases that we grew up grow up with takes time but um really like that should be the goal if we are aiming at inclusivity thank you thank you no i'll come to you now yeah so uh like karishma said um making an accessible revolution right so i speak on behalf of my community um so, you know, um, earlier when I would imagine 
no i think we are facing some technical lag at your end let me come back to you let's uh, hear from kavita next so i think i'm um, i'm really inspired by the speakers here and i think that is the essence of our game as well that um, girls decisions matter uh it's so powerful to see girls voices and representation here from girls who've chosen to do what they believe in so that is really the message from the game itself which is uh you know take decisions that work for you and um go and do things try things out don't be so afraid of, you know of of what people will say what will happen and i think each one here is an example of that so that's that's really the message that we want to leave behind with the game and i really liked um, karishma's message about including the most marginalized so uh, this game is for 15 to 19 year olds it's free of it's going to be freely downloadable everybody who has access to a phone even if it's your dad's phone please download and play uh, you know at least it's a safe space for you to actually explore issues such as these which are taboo which you can't discuss and uh, that's really what i i would uh, you know like to say here okay thank you thank you kavita no i see you you're back uh, would you we couldn't hear you yeah so i was just saying that uh, create an accessible revolution accessible to everyone center uh, marginalized voices um so when i formed revival i began to think um of a revolution more in terms of the same the center right the centering from um a bed because most of us are chronically ill and uh, when we have flare ups we can't leave our beds a revolution from our, from our beds a revolution that happens um even if we don't move a revolution that happens for all abilities right yes, an absolutely. accessible revolution um you can walk um limp wheel into a revolution um revival is like a reclamation of the self and a reclamation of the disabled body so um yeah just that thank you so much new very very inspiring sachi with last i'll come to you and with that we'll close our panel yes Yeah, I'll be really quick. I think uh, what I'd want to tell aspiring change makers would be a, to speak up, to not be afraid. And I think when you speak up, that's where change really begins. Uh, second, which I um, you know try to imbibe every day, being open to unlearning, and I think that's really really important. Um, I think those are two points I would just want to you know close with. Wonderful. All right. Thank you so much, all of you. It was real pleasure hosting you all today. I think uh, each one of you are a true, true legend and inspiration for many, many change makers out there. And we really, really look forward to keep having more of these conversations, keep building stronger communities, and keep breaking the walls uh, that is so, so required. All right. Thank you so much. Next, we have a very interesting conversation with Lisa Mangal Das and Anish, which will be moderated by my friend Nina, uh, and they're discussing pleasure politics. So I welcome Nina, and over to you. Thank you, Ashish. You did a wonderful job moderating that session, and I, and I definitely want to share with the audience that you know, um, this event was happening at Mash, and uh, Ashish told me about it, and I said I definitely want to partner with you guys. And it's been such a learning because I saw you know Ankur and Medha with the entire framework that they had put together, and for me, there's been such a learning while curating this itself because words like privilege, unlearning, inclusivity, talking of uh, an excessive revolution i have i'm learning while people are talking now i'm learning while we were putting this together so it's been a really wonderful experience and i hope all of you who are attending are also learning i think um, it's almost like i was talking to anish who's joining us right now that it's even one person who's who's changed can then hopefully change one more person in terms of you know their thought process so um i'm really excited about today's conversation and uh, I have with me the Lisa Mangal Das and the Anish Gawande. Thank you so much for joining, and I'm I'm so happy that we could uh, make this happen. Thanks for having us, and thanks yes, for all the work sorry. you've uh, put in to make this wonderful event happen. I know it couldn't happen without you, Nina. Thank you so much, Lisa, and thank you, Anish, tolerating the time difference and all of that. Wonderful to have you guys, and I want the speakers to know. that the topic today is a very very interesting one so it's not only pleasure and politics but it's also about the politics of pleasure so wrap your head around that guys um 
So, so Lisa, for those of you who don't know, and I'm, I'd be shocked if you don't know, but uh, Lisa is India's foremost pleasure positive content creator. And, um, and, and Anish is the curator and co-founder of Pinklist's first, uh, India's first archive of politicians who support LGBTQIA community and their rights. And, and I, before we take off, I definitely want, an, uh, you know, Lisa, you first, and then Anish to talk a little bit about the work that you're doing. Anish, first of all, I'm so excited to finally talk to you. Um, I've admired your work for a long time. Um, do you want to go first, though? I just wanted to say that. No, go first. Go first. Oh. Now such <laughs> praise, then I can't go immediately after. I'm already Pehle, pehle up, pehle up. <laughs> oh, um, so I create sex education content on Instagram, YouTube, and I now have a podcast. It's all free. Um, and I also try my best to do it in Hindi as well. I wish I could do it in every Indian language, but sadly, I don't speak that many languages. Um, but yeah, my goal actually came from me not finding what I wanted. I mean, as a young person, just sort of exploring my sexuality, my looking for sexual health resources, it, it was quite challenging. I'm 31 now. I've started this sort of as a passion project seven years ago. Um, but it's it's been... The thing that I wish I had access to in a way is a place where you can ask questions, where no question is too stupid, where you can find out, you know, stuff about STIs, contraception, pleasure, sex toys, all of that stuff that any young person might be curious about. I felt especially, I think we've made some progress already, but a few years ago, it was even harder. And, and I think for anyone who's not a cishet man, it's still, relatively speaking, harder than so at the time I didn't see many women having the freedom to have these conversations I feel really lucky and privileged to have a family background that is supportive like I think for a lot of people they wouldn't be able to talk about this even if they wanted to because their own family father-in-law I don't know mom dad whatever would probably take um, you know would not be okay with it the trolling starts at home for so many so I feel really lucky and I felt that since I had that opportunity and freedom I should I might not have all the answers, but at least I can create a space where we can ask the questions and I can find the right people to answer things that are beyond my own purview. I'm not a doctor, uh, but it's just been wonderful. It's grown so much, especially over the last two years. And I think people, more and more people and Gen Z in particular is so keen to have these conversations. It's like you just give that sense that it's okay to talk about sex here and the stories and the questions and the interest. And it's like a really positive interest. It's just explosive. So that's, I've, I've learned so much from my community. And um, sorry, I'm talking so much, but it's something that really excites me. And I feel grateful to be able to have just, I don't, this just passion project evolved into something that now is pretty much my whole life. That's wonderful, Lisa. Thank you for the work that you do. Uh, Anish, coming to you a bit about yourself, please. Yes. So Lisa, firstly, thank you so much for all the content you create. I think what's really amazing is that talking about sex without shame is such a radical act in and of itself, right? I think growing up, I never had that opportunity. I think as a gay man, I was sort of always associating sex with shame and seeing your content, which is both funny and educative and just fun, is just a breath of fresh air. I think I came into sort of my work with queer activism, queer advocacy in a very similar way. I think growing up, I never thought that I could come out of the closet because I was very clear I want to become a lawyer, I want to sort of work in politics, and of course it's impossible to be queer in Indian politics. So I was very much in the closet, I had given up all sort of expectations of ever coming out, and which was obviously very unhealthy, until I went to the US to go study that. And I think it still took me more than a year after going to possibly the most progressive place on this planet, New York City, to still come out of the closet. And once I went there, I said, well, now I've come out of the closet, I have to obviously abandon all hopes of politics. So I had completely gone on the way of academia and I thought that I would continue on. I was studying comparative literature. I was very happy sitting in a library for very long. When I got a call from someone I volunteered for, Milan Devra in South Bombay, who said, why don't you come manage my election? And I said, well, you know, Milan, the last time I worked for you, I was uh, not gay. I'm very out now, and this is Indian politics. Are you sure? And he said, yeah, let's see. Who says anything? You come back to India, we'll figure it out. And I took a leap of faith. After graduation, I ended up working on the 2019 Lok Sabha election campaign and ended up realizing that there was a lot more support for queer rights amongst politicians than we'd previously imagined. 
it was also a very strange space, right? It was the space where Section 377 was still on the books. The Supreme Court had not struck it down yet. Uh, we were in this strange moment where we didn't know whether the courts would be relied upon to get any plausible prospect of change. And so a lot of people were doing things in their own spheres. You know, Parme Shani, whose book I have right here and who I worked with, uh, started the Godrej India Culture Lab, did queer activism in business and in culture. There were a lot of others doing it in education. And I said, well, this is the place where I know how to make a difference, so why not try it in politics? And so that's why Pinkless came about. It came about as a space for young queer people to know that they can be queer and in politics and find their allies and potential mentors. It also came as a resource base for a lot of queer folks who didn't know who to turn to when faced with a problem that required political assistance. For example, during COVID, when we had men's wards and female wards, but we didn't have any trans wards or we didn't have any non-binary wards for people who were COVID positive or isolating. And we sort of wanted to be that bridge and say, well, this is the MP you can reach out to. These are the people you can reach out to. This is how you navigate the political structure. And so that's how Pink List came about and keeps me busy. I can't, I can't wait for you to come back to India, Anish, and see the kind of work that you do. I, I really can't wait for it to sort of get amplified. It's um, wonderful to hear your journey. And I think that's the most important thing when you have conversations to know where people are coming from. So both of you are Columbia Minds. And like I was telling you, Anish and Lisa, that the closest I got to Columbia was my therapist who was across the road, who thought that Wellbutrin was a great way of losing weight. And it just gave me the shakes. So I never went back to him ever again. So um, that's me and Columbia. <laughs> but I... <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I mean, I want to know, Lisa, you know, starting with you, that how do you think that studying in the West influenced you with the kind of work that you're doing? and in your journey uh so first i just want to say that like i i am not in any way trying to suggest that the west is better or somehow exempt from you know all the various issues in this space whether it's sexual harassment or homophobia or misogyny or transphobia i mean you know the list of prejudices and forms of oppression that face our society actually are pretty much facing every society. I think there's a tendency to like, because we have this colonial hangover and all of this thing, like, oh, India is so bad and the West is so great, but that's not true. I mean, even in New York City, you will encounter all of this. And we've seen with, I mean, who their former president was, right? How did such a person get elected? And, and actually speaking, I've met very conservative people in the West as well, more conservative than most Indians I know. So I don't want to, I'm not at all, please don't read this as like, oh, I had, you know, the best time ever there and now I'm here and uh -huh. it's not as good because that's not what I'm saying at all. So I just want to make that clear. However, I think Colombia in particular is quite unique in that it is extremely diverse. So it's not like I was only meeting people from the West. I was meeting people, I've never met that many people from different parts of the country, from different parts of the world, you know, whether it's, I mean, name a continent and there'll be a student from, actually name a country I feel I would almost say name a country uh, you know I had friends from like as varied places as Haiti and you know um, Sweden like really really diverse and that was fantastic because you're exposed to just such a wealth of perspectives you know it really kind of opens your mind to the various types of experiences and circumstances and ideas political viewpoints um, family kind of circumstances that so many people have. And I think that's really unique to certain, I mean, how do you get that diverse a community? It isn't that easy. And, and, and I think in that regard, certain educational environments in certain parts of the world are unique in that they draw people from all over the world. Um, so that was really enriching. It's also extremely liberal. I don't think all of the US is anywhere near as liberal. Um, so I think in that again, that's kind of anomalous rather than the norm, you know? So I'm talking very specifically about that, my college experience. And I am very grateful to have been able to come of age in that sort of environment where um, I never felt like I had to hide who I am. I don't know if that was the case for everybody who attended, but that was my personal experience. And I also felt extremely um, sort of free to express my sexuality, to access sexual health resources. I was an RA. And I had a bag of condoms on my door. You know, anyone can take them. And the dorms were all genders on the same floor. Um, later on, there were even suites where anyone of any gender could live together with their whatever friend. But I mean, you know, it didn't matter. They weren't like surveilling your identity and relationships. And that was wonderful. 
Um, I also really appreciated that there were consent workshops for incoming students. I mean, things like that, which were less frequently the let's say in um, colleges actually i think in most parts of the world were quite sort of well um you know absorbed into the way things were run i i also think that you know having been um that age like i was 17 when i went to college i think at least for me a lot of my first experiences took place in that context and and i felt lucky for that because i never felt judged i never felt that because i'm a woman the gender role I have to play in the dating arena or in bed <laughs> um, was any different from anyone of any other gender, you know? And I valued that a lot. I think it really gave me a sex positive take on um, sort of my personal life, which maybe I didn't have coming into college. Um, there was also this really cool website called Go Ask Alice. Actually, not a website. It was like a resource for students where you could oh, ask nice. a sexual health question or anything about sex, no question was too stupid. And an expert would get like a, you know, somebody who really knew what they were talking about. I'm not sure if they were doctors or people from health services or some combination thereof. But professional answers would be given to student questions about sex and the body. I mean, anything, you know, from masturbation to like gonorrhea, that really didn't matter what your question was. There was no, nothing was out of bounds. And I appreciated that. So these were some resources that I missed when I came here. Uh, uh -huh. uh, I'm sure that there's, I mean, as you're seeing all these wonderful people on your event, there's obviously amazing people doing amazing work, but I wish it was more widely accessible and that there were even more people doing it, right? Absolutely. So I think there's never too many people working in um, sexual and reproductive health and rights, you know? And so I was inspired to do something that was contextually relevant for young Indians. Um, and I would say to some extent, those experiences in college did, in, you know, did have an influence on me. Yeah, no, Lisa, and also, you know, when one thinks of New York, when I when I first went to New York, I thought, oh, my God, this is America. When I got married yeah. and I moved to, to New York, I was like, oh, my God, this really is America. Till I started traveling all over and I realized. And then I moved it to North Carolina. I moved to North Carolina, which was like, you're not black, you're not white, you must be Hispanic. And I'm there, pregnant, in labor. I'm like, speak in English. So th they're very different from what all of America is not New York. New York is like a microcosm and then the... The rest of America mm. is completely different. Um, yeah, wonderful to hear about your, your journey and your experience at Columbia. Anish, what about you? How much do you feel like the West influenced you and made you more comfortable or not? Or like, what's your experience been? So very similar, I think, to Lisa, except I think it was, it was really strange for me because I went from Bombay where I didn't even know a single queer person to Colombia, where suddenly people had already come out of the closet. It was a very normal thing, which in some ways was more alienating, right? Where I was like, I don't know who to go to to get help coming out because everyone seems to have done this already. So it almost felt like I was late to the game. So it actually took me more than a year to come out. So there are these sort of strange ways in which New York plays home to so many different identities and so many different stages of identities. That was very helpful for me when I came back. I think what was really incredible was that I was in New York City at a moment of incredible change, right? So I entered in 2014, graduated in 2018. In the last two years of Obama pres Obama's presidency and in the first two of Donald Trump's, it was a moment of incredible amounts of activism. It was where you saw the Million March for Climate, which was the largest climate march to have taken place to, to sort of happen in New York City. You saw the Black Lives Move Matter movement really begin at that stage. I mean, on campus, it was Emma Sulkowitz, who was a student who carried a mattress I around against a, against a sort of student who had sexually assaulted her, who started off the conversation around Title IX and sexual assault on U.S. colleges that eventually snowballed into the Me Too movement that you see today. And I think it was a really instructive space because I think it taught me a lesson that's been very valuable since that's uh that is just because you can say something doesn't mean you should say it i think acknowledging privilege understanding the sort of um racialized identities that we inhabit in a sort of multiracial society i think was very instructive in my return to india and then navigating my caste privilege and my class privilege right and sort of understanding the ways in which conscious and unconscious bias operates the ways in which 
there need to be certain safe spaces that are open for certain communities. And you know, you come up with these sort of constant arguments that, oh, why should it only be for these people? Why should you have reservations? Why should you have anything else? And when you're put in a position where you're not the dominant group, I think it really uh-huh. makes you reflect upon your role as a dominant group back home, which I think has been really helpful and particularly instructive in the political sphere. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, okay, I'm sure people are waiting for us to start our Q and A. So these are my my first question. Q you. again, you're one of the foremost people talking about pleasure, and um, and and I, I I want you to talk a bit about uh, female pleasure. And can you explain the female anatomy to us? Because I think people don't even realize that. I I, I let you. I let you take over here. All right. Um, I do like talking about the anatomy of the vulva. Um, it is one of my favorite topics. I even have a little um, model of the vulva here, very helpful. So I will use it to explain some stuff. Um, first of all, actually, I want to ex- clarify that while many people refer to the whole external genital area as the vagina, in fact, it is called the vulva, and only the canal in here, um, you know, from which menstrual blood exits and into which. Um, you could insert a tampon, menstrual cup, penis, sex toy, your finger, whatever you like, is the vagina. Only that is the vaginal canal. This, the rest of it, which is the labia. Sorry, I don't know why I'm seeing like a mirror image of myself. So when I turn right, it like it's turning the other way. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so this um, exterior sort of uh, skin and the top part where the pubic hair would be, um, the, well, the top part where the pubic hair would be is called the mons, which is a word that means mountain in Latin or something, your mound, you know, your pubic mound. And then that kind of um, gives way to the labia majora or the outer lips. Uh-huh. Um, so this area, and then these inner lips are called the labia minora. Then right under the um, sort of start of the labia, there's generally a clitoral hood. And under that is the little clitoris can you see that although the clitoris isn't just the p-shaped nub at the top and we're going to get to that in a second but for now this is the external clitoris the glands of the clitoris it's central to pleasure for most vulva owners this is the urethra out of which pee comes out and as i said that's the vagina so these are the external genitals i hope that was clear it was a bit uh, tricky for me because the image i'm seeing is a bit i don't know is reflective or something so i was Pointing in the wrong okay, direction. I just have to point out, can... Anisha looks a little yeah. scared, and I'm going to come to you, Anisha, in a bit to ask you why you look so afraid. Okay, I want to know why you're sort of afraid of vaginas, vulvas, uterus. Why are you so afraid? <laughs> we will come to that in a bit. I don't think he's afraid. Okay, he will tell um, you. We'll, we'll, we'll hear. We'll hear. <laughs> okay, I hope I'm not scaring anyone. I'm sorry if this is um, a bit much, but I think it's good, no matter your gender or you know. I think it's nice to know about the human body in general, um, and it comes in all kinds. I mean. Genital diversity is so normal. So this is by no means like the only way a vulva can look, but it's just an educational model. Um, okay, so clitoris, urethra, vagina, right? Labia minor, labia minora, labia majora. Okay, now the clitoris actually extends internally. If I could remove the top layer and show you, it extends like this. And in fact, it straddles the urethra and the vaginal canal. Okay, so... Uh, I'm going to just, gosh, it's hard doing this on a screen. Um, But here, like if this was here, um, if you could remove this and just see what was inside, the clitoris straddles the vaginal canal and the urethra, um, which means that actually there's more to the whole experience of pleasure than just stimulating the external clitoris, although that's very, very um, reliable as a route to orgasm for most vulva owners, a lot of people, because of the sort of heterosexual, heteronormative penetration-centric scripts we're fed about what sex should look like, you know, most people um, assume the definition of sex is penis in vagina penetration, but that is such a limited and unfortunate definition. I mean, sex can be all kinds of things, and some people might never have sex involving a penis and a vagina. So I think we should get rid of that penetration-centric view of sex. Um, Attached to that is the sort of misconception around the G-spot. Right. And I want to uh-huh. explain I want to explain that in just a second. Um, I think most people, most straight couples um, kind of go into sex thinking that penetration should be pleasurable for both parties. Whereas, you know, we learn about erection, penetration and ejaculation in biology lessons in school because that's central to reproduction. But we never learn anything about the clitoris um, or the sort of pleasure related anatomy. Women are supposed to have babies, right? Not orgasms. So I think this misconception that many, um, you know, 
women's magazines and health magazines and things kind of disseminated that like this G spot is some special button to look for inside the vagina. It served this narrative that penetration is the ideal form of sex uh, between a man and a woman, right? Um, women felt like, what's wrong with me? I can't find the structure. Where is this G spot? It made their own anatomy quite mysterious to many valva owners, I think, the mythology surrounding the G spot, when in fact there's no physical gland or bump to look for inside the vaginal canal. Um, it is just an er erogenous zone for many valva owners because of the proximity of the vaginal wall to the so internal no clitoris and there's the no urethra. No, I don't want, look, instead of thinking it, thinking of it as a separate physical structure, which is how many uh -huh. people perceive it, like there's some magic bump or gland or something to look uh -huh. for inside the vagina, the whole sort of um, vaginal wall and particularly the anterior, the upper wall, the one closer to your belly button, um, uh -huh. can feel very sensitive for some people uh -huh. because look at how close the internal clitoris is and the urethra is to this upper wall, right? And to all, the whole vaginal canal, actually, if you think about it. Um, so if you're going to be touching here, you're also stimulating these parts and this part. And, and so the new, um, new terminology, because more contemporary research sort of um, conclusively determined that there is no special structure or bump or gland, but rather this whole complex um, is an erogenous sort of, you know, conglomerate. So they've called it the clitorethrovaginal complex. And I know that's a mouthful, but it makes more sense than G spot. G is like, yeah. you know, it comes out, um, is named after a scientist called Ernst Grafenberg, who proposed this idea that there's something really sensitive going on here. But it was then misconstrued. I mean, a Cosmopolitan magazine even issued an apology for sort of, you know, perpetuating this idea that there's yeah. something physical, like a little bean or something to look for inside the vagina. So anyway, I hope, sorry, I can talk a lot. You should please tell me to stop talking. I want Anish to, <laughs> but this is, yeah, I hope we, I hope we made um, that clear enough. I hope I haven't confused anyone, but that's the valva. And then no, this the thing that I added was just to show you what's um, going on behind the exterior. But just imagine what, what's fascinating is when you put it in that form, you see a model. It's not just that. The, what you see of the clitoris it's just it's there's so much more that gets yeah it's affected. quite a large um sort of structure the clitoris and this is just the tip and oh can i give you one more fun fact i'm sorry i'm yes, sorry yes, 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 one yes. fun fact okay so when you know when we are fetuses all of us we all start off with the exact same genital tissue until sexual differentiation takes place we all start off with this thing called the genital tubercle and uh -huh. that uh, the tissue that becomes a clitoris is the same tissue that becomes a penis. We kind of all start off with a little clitoris in a way. And, uh -huh. and um, many people think, you know, that, the, that like the penis and the vagina are analogous. But in fact, the penis and the clitoris are analogous. The clitoris also becomes engorged with blood when erect. It has a hood, just like the penis has a foreskin. Um, and it responds incredibly to stimulation. So... If we knew that, I mean, you know, can you think of a straight man having sex that it did not involve stimulating his penis? That's unthinkable. However, yeah. um, when when it comes to the pleasure of at least straight women, since I'm a straight woman, it almost seems like clitoral stimulation is some afterthought or add-on or like, yeah. wow, he went down on you, you know? Yes. So I feel, like, yeah. <laughs> I feel like, unfortunately, we don't learn enough about the anatomy. Um, and it would be good if we did. And And yeah, and it's, we're more alike than we are different. We start off with, with very similar, uh, with the same exact tissue until se se um, sexual differentiation takes place. And then it turns into a clitoris, vagina, urethra, labia, etc., or a penis, scrotum, uh, testes, etc. And if you look at the skin of a scrotum and the skin of the labia minora, or even, I mean, generally that region for anyone, for vulva owners and penis owners, it's actually incredibly similar, the texture of the skin um and the appearance as well i think we just don't think about that or look at our own genitals very carefully but it's worth knowing i feel and then there's such a diversity yeah. of possibilities in terms of appearance of genitals it's almost like a you know spectrum from clitoris and vagina to penis and testes you know intersex um identity is real it's so sad that some babies at birth are like you know kind of assigned a sex because the, the the doctor feels like they'd have a I don't know more destigmatized life or something if they undergo uh -huh. surgery. So I mean, and even though there's nothing wrong with their health or body, actually, you know, all genitals are normal. Whatever you have in your pants is normal. 
So I wish we saw and understood and got taught about anatomy and genital diversity more. I mean, without, you know, it doesn't have to be pornographic and it can be age appropriate, but I think it's so important we learn about bodies. Mm -hmm. No, that's wonderful. I, I, I love following your content also, Visa. I think it's so important to, for people to learn and you also do talk about use a mirror and see what it looks like down there. You should know what it looks like down there. And most people are afraid to even look down there, right? So Anish, now coming to you, why are, are most gay men afraid of vaginas or are they, are they not? Can you please elaborate on so that? So, you know, that's this is, that first I, I was going to say, this is very different from all the conversations I have. I mostly have conversations with older middle-aged men in sort of white kurta pajamas and this would be <laughs> Bhartiya Sanskriti ke khilaf. So I think this is just, uh, just new territory. But I think what's really interesting to me, right, I think is um, there is this problem, right? It's almost... Uh -huh in schools and everywhere else assume that you only have to learn about your own genitals, number one. What that usually ends up doing, and this happens particularly with gay men because eventually gay men don't encounter vaginas at all after because they're not having sex with them, right? So what that leads to is the sort of categorization of the vagina in a space of disgust. Because desire operates on a spectrum, right? It's desire on one end and disgust on the other. And one of the ways in which gay men are socialized is by treating vaginas as disgusting, as something that is unappealing, as unsexy, because one of the ways in which you reject the idea that you need to have sex with a vagina. And, you know, in, in parts, it's a coping mechanism against heteronormativity. In parts, it's one of the things that you sort of rebel against, but it's also incredibly unhealthy, right? So what that ends up doing is positioning vaginas in a space of disgust for most gay men as something unapproachable. Now there's also, I mean, there's this categories, right? There's a golden gay who is the one who's never had sex with a vagina and then there's platinum gay who's um, had a C-section so has never even come out of a vagina. And this is, I mean, this is, this is part of gay culture. You'll see this in gay magazines, you'll see this in conversation. I've been complicit in it. And I think it took a lot of reflecting to understand what that translates into, right? I think particularly today when we assume that vaginas operate in a space of disgust and not desire, you automatically assume that anyone who has a vagina is undesirable. Now, this becomes incredibly tricky with gay men in particular because then if you ask them, what about a trans man who might have a vagina? If you're a gay man, you're attracted to men, then what about trans men, right, who might have a vagina? In theory, you should be attracted to them because your sexuality is defined by gender, not sex. On the flip side, if you ask them if you are attracted to a sexual organ, then will you have sex with someone who is a trans woman, but with a penis? Right? So if you're attracted to penises, then you should be having sex with a trans woman. And often, because of the ways in which vaginas have been coded and discussed, and the ways in which the disgust for a vagina is very rooted in the patriarchy. You see a very, dis I mean, not disgusting, but a nefarious brand of patriarchy that infiltrates into gay culture, right? And I think it's one of the ways in which understanding desire and disgust is important because it's not that just because you're queer, you're automatically progressive on all things desire or that you're sort of not imbibing a lot of the prejudices around you because your disgust for the vagina is actually correlating to feeding into justifying and upholding your transphobia and I think it's something that a lot of gay men have to contend with something I've had to contend with I think it's something I hadn't thought of before until I sort of had friends who brought it up and I think it's a process of unlearning that I wish had started earlier I wish it had started with Lisa coming to my school and telling me that this is how a vagina <laughs> works and it's not some random strange object that came out of a UFO and that men should learn about vaginas and women should learn about penises and we should just really know what organs are. I mean, we all learn about the heart, no? I mean, also, at least our biology lesson, I didn't even see that chapter. I think we had scratched it out. There was <laughs> yeah, no so question. Was, but, sexual organs don't exist. You know, uh, Anish, you say something that's really um, important, actually. I would extend to that. While I recognize the specificities of how this might apply to the way a gay men might talk about vaginas, I think more, if you were to zoom out, actually the vagina is coded in disgust so insidiously and so um, sort of relentlessly that 
even straight men and in fact even women have internalized that sense of disgust mm. i mean look at the number of products that are marketed to us vaginal whitening cream yeah. hair removal w- intimate wash to get rid of odor blah 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 i mean like there's a whole you know lineup of ways that you need to make your vagina good enough otherwise in its natural state is smelly disgusting yucky i mean that's the type of sort of language even though we don't talk about things so openly in public that is the type of thing that i see in my dms men writing to me being like uh you know you talk about oral sex being really pleasurable from i just think it's going to be so yucky i can't imagine like licking my girlfriend's pussy or whatever and so many women writing to me being like i am so uncomfortable receiving oral sex because i can't stop thinking about how gross it must taste and smell i always tell him no when he goes down on me even though my boyfriend really wants to go down on me is that weird am i normal things like this you know because i think um and i think a lot of heterosexual women or women who haven't been allowed to even think about their sexuality outside of the heteronormative default setting that we all seem you know inadvertently inherit um will when you know when 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 speaking to like let's say a bisexual woman friend or a lesbian woman friend and even and i think yeah, the younger me was like this too the idea even though i have a vagina of like going down on another vagina i think again internalized homophobia or whatever it is seemed like Oh, I don't think I could do that, you know. I I I think I could do that now. But um it was a it was it was getting over my own internalized misogyny and perhaps even homophobia. I don't I think it was more misogyny. We internalize so much misogyny. We see our own bodies as disgusting and imperfect and anyway pop culture keeps telling women that they're just gross and fat and ugly and do this and eat this and you know, there's like a whole industry that thrives on instilling body insecurities in women. So it's a larger thing not even restricted to the vagina, but I would definitely say that there's something to be thought about with regard to the vagina being coded in disgust. It's mm-hmm. so important to think about. And straight men too. I mean even if you look at like like I mean I I feel like I need to wear my academic hat. It's been a while. I've been on social media so long. But there's so many men who even I mean you know white men who we all look up to as the best scholars or whatever yeah. who express their disgust around the vagina. and i also feel that you know pornography also really propagates it right the, the way of your your vagina is supposed to look the way the penis is supposed to look it's supposed to be a particular shape color it's supposed to be beautiful and it's not always like that right and and when i'm hearing both of you talk i'm thinking of the politics of it it's coming to my head anish when you're talking about this that um i i remember thinking i feel like sex education that show and even the bold type was so educated because when i that was the first time i thought of um you're not queer enough somebody is not queer enough that's almost politicizing this topic as well that you can't come to this party or you can't be part of our group because you're not queer enough so what are your thoughts on that anish so you know just to zoom out a little i want to want to relate it more directly to politics with a capital p we think sex is different politics is different right these are uh-huh, uh-huh. these are spaces that have been kept purposefully separate uh-huh. i think the first thing is that sex has always been political I think mm-hmm. men's control on women's bodies is the foundation of most of the power structures we have today, right? I think this goes all the way back to prohibition on prostitution. I think it's led to the greatest solidarity. I mean in India, it was Namdev Dhasal who was a Dalit panther in Bombay who led one of the first marches of trans people and sex workers to demand ration cards because these were communities denied ration cards because of the work they did because sex was so stigmatized. So st- sex became political. because the way you sort of engaged with sex denied you certain rights and denied you certain responsibilities uh, moving to the ways in which we talk about sex right i think the ways in which we particularly talk about sex in the political sphere um i want to take two very specific examples one is around the fight for lgbtq plus rights in india and the second is around the sort of conversations we have around assault in particular Uh, so the trigger warning for both of these things moving forward i think to me i mean i grew up in the shadow of the fight against section 377 which is india's colonial era anti sodomy law so it prohibits carnal intercourse against the order of nature so it's a victorian era law brought by the british which essentially prohibits um any form of non penile vaginal sex so oral sex anal sex um across any form of different gender sexualities etc right 
Uh, it's a fight that was fought primarily by the queer community alongside the sort of AIDS movement and the feminist movement in the country. And a lot of the language that we had to deploy even while fighting back against this law was that of stigma, of discrimination, of abuse, right? It was, oh, this is, this is criminalizing gay people. This is leading to sort of blackmail and extortion. And while all of these are valid, I think what we shied away from, and I think in a way that's truly been incredibly damaging because, you know, protests and movements are a really great way of building conversations and effecting change in a more dramatic way is pleasure. You know, in all of this, we didn't acknowledge that, well, I don't want to get rid of 377 just because I might be blackmailed for it. I want to get rid of 377 because as a gay man, I want pleasure, right? So it was not that queer people have the right to pleasure. It was that queer people have the right not to be discriminated against, which is why you see a lot of arguments even today, right? I mean, sure, gay people are not bad, but they just shouldn't have sex, right? Being gay is not wrong, but you shouldn't act upon it. And when we absent pleasure, when we sort of disfigure pleasure, when we sort of remove pleasure from our conversations around politics, around rights, we do a disservice to the very communities we represent. Right? Mm -hmm. It plays very, very powerfully in conversations around assault as well. Right? I think, again, a lot of conversations around assault, again, trigger warning here, are around uh, harm, are around mutilation, are around um, sort of violence, I think they don't account for the fact that there is a scarring of pleasure. There is something deeply mm -hmm. problematic about assault, that it doesn't end at assault, right? That it is something that leaves an imprint on the future of pleasure and the need to unlearn that when you move forward. And I think that's why when people sort of ask, oh, why do we treat assault differently? Like, how is it different? I mean, it is different from so many other injuries, right? Because it affects something so pivotal to ourselves. And when we mm -hmm. remove pleasure out of this context, when we sort of yeah. refuse to engage with pleasure in these conversations, we, we don't have that space to acknowledge the ways in which pleasure is political. And I think that prevents us from fighting for it in a more sort of robust way. No, thank you for making those points, Anish. And I mean, again, talking to you guys, I'm learning from every single conversation, right? Um, so Lisa, coming to you, that where does pleasure politics stand for women, and especially in the context of India? What are your thoughts? Um, I, I think I want to talk about stuff again, in, because I think whenever I say, oh, India is like this, and these are all the problems in India, it sounds like I'm saying, or at least I get this type of comments and, you know, when I make these points, as if I'm, like, I'm saying only India is like this. You yeah. Know? I'm not saying only India is like this, because honestly, the more and more I read and think and travel and whatever, every year of my life, I feel like, oh my gosh, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, this uh -huh. is happening. Do you know what I mean? Uh -huh. I think yeah, globally, yeah. we're still deeply entrenched in patriarchal, cis, heteronormative, paradigms, for lack of a better word. Um, and some people are just better at being politically correct than others. But I think the prejudices are deep rooted. I mean, they've been around for centuries. It's not going to change overnight. You know, change is really radical. It's incremental. And I think some people with a slightly better education or more privilege or whatever, learn the language or try their best. But I would say that most people, and, and, and I'm not even excluding myself from this, I mean, I have internalized misogyny I'm getting over. I probably have caste and class privilege that I haven't sufficiently examined. And um, I, I hope I hope that I don't perpetuate any kind of oppression, but you know, maybe I do. And most people do. Even with the best of intentions, you have to unlearn all the stuff that you absorbed as a, you know, from day one of your life, basically, because it's everywhere. I mean, I think misogyny and patriarchy are so omnipresent that you almost don't even notice it. You just think that's the norm. You know, I think so many, anyway, sorry, I have the tendency to rant. I should um, <laughs> control that. But but um, let me get back to politics and pleasure. And so I, I want to just say that rather than just looking at this as an India thing, I think it's a pretty global thing, but I'm sure some things will resonate for Indians listening. Um, so, you know, uh, I think that Generally, societies and our society, for sure, creates this sort of hierarchy of context within which it's acceptable to have sex. You know, you can ideally only, you should ideally only have sex within a marriage, a same religion, same caste, opposite sex marriage, right? And that is the only truly acceptable 
context and the man should be the initiator. Uh, you know, the woman must reluctantly participate. Uh, and I mean, this endogamous framework that's like literally set up to reproduce existing <laughs> social inequalities is the norm, even today, even among the very privileged people. I mean, most people end up marrying someone within their own community and then, you know, at least publicly can't be open about it if they were sexually active before marriage. And then uh -huh. you're supposed to have a baby right after you get married, right? So we just keep perpetuating the existing structures of privilege and oppression, right? Um, I, I also, the, the, the womb literally becomes this kind of like factory to replicate the existing class and caste and religion and community, all other divisions, right? That's what endogamy is all about. Um, and I think, unfortunately, women aren't ever really can sort of uh, raised or socialized or whatever to be aware of their own autonomy and agency. It's like you're you belong to your parents until you belong to your husband, right? And often these decisions are made for people, particularly for women. There's a certain age by which you must get married. It's usually so young that you never even have the opportunity to think about who you are, what you want, whether you want to get married, whether you're gay, straight, bisexual, yeah. asexual, trans, like you're so young, right? And um, I think that this whole cycle kind of just keeps oppression and privilege and all of it going like a hamster on a wheel, you know? Um, so I'm really not a fan of marriage at all in each to their own. And I know some people don't have the choice. It's an inevitability, not a choice, right? Even the word premarital, extramarital, it's as if marital is necessary. What is premarital sex for me? I'm never getting married. It's just sex, you know? Um, anyway, uh, the other thing I think is that, so within that acceptable hierarchy, right? With uh, heterosexual, same caste, same, uh, same religion type of marriage at the top, uh -huh. ideally for babies only, everything else is considered inferior or shameful or wrong, right? Sex outside of marriage, sex before marriage, sex with someone of another community other than your own, queer sex, sex work, and like even masturbation, the arguably yeah. the safest form of experiencing sexual pleasure, you know, without any um, concerns for pregnancy, disease, or rejection. Even that is considered shameful, right? So many people... Yeah have so much shame around masturbation that they keep worrying that all kinds of terrible things will happen to them if they masturbate. I get this in my DMs. It's probably the most frequent question. Like, will I go blind? Will I experience hair fall, pimples? Will I go to hell? Will I find a wife if I masturbate, you know? Oh, um, good Lord. Wow. Yeah, and also, I, the other thing you asked with regard to women, pleasure as a result of all of this and the whole patriarchal and endogamous kind of premise within which sex is expected to function, especially for women, um, pleasure is very gender unequal, particularly for heterosexual couples, right? Studies have, I mean, there's this whole talk about the orgasm gap and orgasm equality, um, which is, you know, the finding that from numerous studies, there's a discrepancy between how often straight women experience orgasm as compared to the rest of the population in the sense that straight men, gay men, lesbian women, um, bisexual people are all more likely to report that they have an orgasm frequently or always during sex than straight women are able to do, right? And the fact that bisexual and lesbian women are able to report more orgasms more frequently is indicative of the fact that it isn't about anatomy, right? You don't need a penis to have an orgasm. You need someone who's invested in your pleasure. So, um, and straight men, unfortunately, statistically speaking, seem less invested in their partner's pleasure than anyone else. So when you think about that, right, I mean, we're talking about gender equality in the boardroom, but what about gender equality in the bedroom? Like surely the number of pleasurable sexual experiences the sexually active community in a country is having is quite a good indicator of how gender equal the society is. I mean, what what is, um, you know, what does it mean to have equal rights if I'm the CEO, but my husband doesn't know where my clitoris is, you know? So I just think we need to think about the fact that in fa pleasure is actually a huge indicator of how developed and progressive and free a society is. I mean, we're still, we have governments controlling who we can marry, whether we can marry, whether we can get abortion, uh, whether we have access to abortion, um, you know, deciding things like what's what type of sexual acts are acceptable at what age and, this, and, and all over the world. I'm not saying necessarily India. There's many countries yeah. which still criminalize a lot of the things even Anish was talking about. And so I just, I mean, and look at America and their abortion rights. Like, this is such a global Absolutely. issue. Yes. I think so right. that there is so right. 
tendency to surveil, control, and and also look at, I mean, capitalism ensures that we are at work all day, so we have no time for pleasure except at night, you know? Yes. <laughs> and politics are like attacking um, our restrict, I mean, the, our ability to express ourselves, access healthcare. There's so much, there is an, like, if you think about it, again, it's one of those things which you don't see until you see and then you can't unsee. Like, uh -huh. there's a lot of factors controlling our ability to experience and access pleasure. And I really think pleasure is an amazing indicator of development. Seriously. But, but I want to stay with that thought, Lisa. And I want to ask you, coming back to the anatomy um, question, right? That I think there's so much content out there telling us that the penis size doesn't matter. But I think there's not enough out there telling us that, um, is there such a thing as vagina depth? Is there something as, uh, you know, known as vagina depth? Um, so, you know, obviously there's variation from person to person and general diversity is very normal. But I mean, uh -huh. this, like if you look this up, there's various studies and things to come up with some sort of average. But averages, I mean, anyway, maybe they're helpful just as an indicator. Um, I think that it's worth noting, though, first and foremost, that I personally do not think that the shape or size of any body part actually matters. You can have a very pleasurable sexual experience with just your fingers, <laughs> sometimes even touching a non-genital body part. And um, certainly, regardless of what shape or size of body part you have, you are capable of having incredibly pleasurable sexual experiences if that's what you are looking for. So I want to just get that out of the way. Like, I love to quote my friend Aaron Call who says Dil bada hona chahiye bas. So I want to just say that <laughs> first. Okay? I love because, it. I yeah, love, I love it. it. I can't take credit for it but I love this line from Aaron. He's um, a creator as well. Very funny and I've stolen this line and I say it all the time because I, I want to shout from the rooftops. Dil bada hona chahiye bas. Anyway, since you asked um, the average vagina, it is suggested as per studies, is around three to five inches deep. And um, okay. average erect penile length is supposed to be around five inches when erect. So I think, um, I don't know if that's helpful. Some people don't have sex with these combination of these two. But just since it tends to be an insecurity for straight men, at least, or maybe all men, I don't know, penis owners, let's say, uh, around size. Um, those are the averages. I don't think women really think about vaginal depth that much. I don't know. I could be width? wrong. But... Okay. Okay. Since we're on the topic, Lisa, what about width? I want to know your thoughts. Look, on the width. vagina is, is an extremely fantastic. I mean, it is absolutely mesmerizing how the vagina functions. Think about the fact that a vagina can have a whole baby come out of it and also hold a tiny little tampon in place, right? It is like an accordion or a rubber band or like, like a balloon without air in it. The walls are together. And then when you put yeah. something into it or something has to come out of it, it expands. It has this incredibly elastic tissue surrounding it, as well as a, um, the ability to secrete lubri its own lubrication, right? Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, after all, childbirth via vaginal delivery is something that many, many, many vagina owners go through and they survive and have incredible sex lives after as well. So... The vagina is in a way designed to expand and contract, right? Um, I mean, I think that this idea that like sex makes the vagina loose or whatever is yeah, complete yeah. bullshit and only slut shaming women. Um, the vagina will expand temporarily upon arousal or to accommodate penetration, and then it will return to its sort of um, default form, you know, shortly uh -huh. after. The only things that can impact the elasticity of the vaginal tissue are like multiple childbirths or difficult vaginal deliveries. Um, sometimes that can kind of like um, cause the vaginal tissue to lose its a little bit of its elasticity. Uh -huh. but, uh -huh. but generally, I mean, even after giving birth to a child, many people find that you know, within a few weeks, you know, or maybe a few months, it does re um, go back to its sort of default elasticity. So it's quite amazing what the vagina can do and how it can um, accommodate something as sort of demanding on the body as childbirth and yet yeah, also yeah. you know hold a tampon in place as i said earlier but i mean i really think all of this fixation on how things how big how wide how like i wish we would not worry about all that stuff because no matter what shape size and all of that and i'm not just saying this to be politically correct or to please i don't know a wide audience and not get in trouble i genuinely believe this and i think that two really easy things that have nothing to do with size um that you can in incorporate into your sex life no matter your gender uh, lube and sex toys I highly recommend uh -huh. um, do it stop lovely. worrying about how big or wide or whatever <laughs> things are lovely yeah. lovely no thanks for that Lisa uh, Anish coming to you again when we were sort of preparing for this we came up with this this line right that uh, that 
that why are straight men so afraid of butt play? Why are they afraid of butt play? The moment you say, so first of all, if a woman, this is this is what I've heard from a number of people that if if a, a woman asks her her boyfriend, can I can I lick your asshole? And okay, whoever's listening out there, do not judge me. But like, if a woman says to her boyfriend, can I lick your asshole? Um, he'll be like, no, what's wrong with you? But if it's a one night stand or a hookup, it still might be a little different. So the approach of like a straight man, what my understanding is that they have an issue with butt play. Um, what are your thoughts? What have you heard? I'd love to know. You know, this is this is the this is the amazing thing. It's for straight men. It's everything but. But it's everything but but, but. but. when it should be everything but because if you're a penis owner, your G spot or your most erogenous zone is in your bum. It's up your ass. So I think. For me, it's amazing that straight men haven't discovered the joys of butt play because I think once you start, there's no going back. And I think it's that initial disgust which is preventing you from sticking anything up there. It could be a finger, it could be a toy, it could be a strap on, you know, go wild, do whatever you want. But the sort of fear of experimentation, again, coming from the space of disgust, is to me sometimes very surprising. Because I think it again comes from this assumption that sex only goes one direction. Uh-huh. It only takes one form and it ends in a certain way. Right. And I think getting rid of that notion is so important. I think what's been really, really uh, fascinating is seeing a lot of online sex toy shops. I know Sangya Project and a few others have popped up recently on my Instagram timeline where you suddenly see, you know, people commenting about how, and it's usually women who will be able to say this because straight men are still too afraid to comment publicly. Being like, you know, use this on my partner. He loved it so much. And I've started seeing this a little in my friend's circle as well, where you have straight men who are warming up to the idea. And I think that's great because sex comes in all shapes and sizes, types and forms. And denying yourself pleasure either in the form of restrictions on masturbation or in the uh-huh. forms of sort of restrictions of the type of sex you can engage in. It's just uh-huh. sad. We're not living for very long. Climate change is out to get us, you know. Good Lord, Might yeah. as well get all the pleasure we can. <laughs> and that comes in all forms of, you know, experimental forms. But Anish, when I, before we wrap up, and I, when we wrap up, I want to ask both of you to like in one minute, because we did start this, um, this summit, keeping in mind National Youth Day, right? So I want you... Lisa, while Anisha is answering this, I want you to think of this, that what would your message to the youth be at this point, right? And, and Anisha, I want to ask you, what is the secret to male pleasure? What is the secret? What is the secret to male pleasure is breaking down all the stereotypes you have about everything that you've ever learned about sex. If you have grown up as a straight man, assume a priori that everything you've learned about sex is rubbish. It's completely designed to keep you away from pleasure, both your own and that of anyone you are having sex with. And for young people, I think it's amazing. I went back to school um, a few years ago. I'm not that old, huh? like I'm 25. Thanks, so, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I have to say this because then people are like, oh, you went back to school, matlab what? I went back to school like four years after passing out of school. And in school, I would never have even imagined that you could think of coming out. Like that was such a, and I grew up in Bombay, right? Like it's uh-huh. it's arguably a progressive city of all the places. It was unthinkable. And four years later, the school had invited me to speak about LGBT rights. And it was amazing to see that there were a lot of kids who had come out of the closet. They were in sort of young, flirty relationships, holding hands and coming up to me, oh, giggly eyed saying, you know, oh, we've just come out and we've done this. And it's incredible. So I think for me, it's so important. I think it's a chance that me and so many others like me didn't have, which is as a young person, love is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Pleasure is beautiful. Experiment. Find the ways that you understand, seek and receive pleasure and figure it out. And you don't get those many chances after. And it's really beautiful to have that space to figure it out and to really give yourself the space to figure it out. And just enjoy yourself. I love that. I love that. Lisa, what would your message for the youth be? You know, Anish is so eloquent and he really said everything I want to say. So <laughs> I'm just going oh, to... Oh. me blush. 
Oh, oh honey. <laughs> I hope you're not so afraid of vaginas anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, um, no, I'm sorry. But on a more serious note, slightly more serious. I think pleasure can be infused into life. It's not only sexual. There's so much pleasure everywhere, you know, if you just open yourself to it. I think we should prioritize pleasure. But um, I like to say it's my little like mission statement for myself um, that I hope that you will join me in imagining a world where all sexual experiences are consensual, safe, and pleasurable. So um, if I had to leave any young listeners with one thing, I think that is that you also imagine that world. I, I think I don't need to say anything else at this point. I really appreciate the fact that uh, you know, both of you made the time to come today and such a, I mean, yesterday when we wrapped up the session with Seema and all, I had a mind map. And, and again, I mean, I have so much to write at this point. There's such a learning, such a learning and uh, keep doing the work that you guys are doing. Really appreciate it. And uh, Ashish, I'm going to invite you on stage to take over to close for the day, please. Thank you, Nina. I think it was uh, such a wonderful listening to Lisa and Anish. I think both of them, I'm personally a big, big fan. Um, and I think couldn't be a better way to end it. Uh, a message for young people to make it cons having pleasures which are consensual, safe and creating a healthier and safer ecosystem. And that's what as young people, we would like to uh, be in a world like that and create a world for everybody doing that. And that's what we're trying to do with this Break the Wall. So thank you so much, Nina, for... Uh, moderating that conversation it was wonderful and i think um, uh, tomorrow as we close the final day of the break the wall uh, we are going to have some very other uh, we're going to have some very other interesting voices to talk about um, consent and abuse so the discussion will see harish ayer uh, aisha adlaka in conversation with parth singh of the quint fit um, and next we'll have a session on parenting how the roles of parenting when it comes to educating your young children uh, Nina would be again having conversation with Swati Jagdish, who's also very famously known on Instagram as Maya's Amma and Niyati Shah. Um, and then we will be closing Break the Wall with a, a very uh, engaging performance by Niti Shah, uh, Taranjit Kaur and Jigyasa Labro, who will be performing their different forms of arts. So do join us tomorrow from 5 to 7 p.m. And we really look forward to seeing you again. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye.